I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series, and we are here in San Francisco. We've brought in a group of independent writers, speakers, bloggers, podcasters, people who are influencing opinion on enterprise IT equipment to talk with companies in their space. The videos you're about to see are a discussion between our Field Day delegates and companies, including Avir, who we have uh, presenting now. If you'd like to learn more about Tech Field Day, go to techfieldday.com. You can learn how, how to be a presenter or a delegate at a future event. You can also find lots of our videos on youtube.com slash techfieldday. Hello, I'm Scott Jashonik. I'm the Director of Product Management with Avir Systems. Uh, we're going to talk about Avir use cases. I'd also like to introduce uh, Bernie. Bernie. Hi, I'm uh, Bernie Bain, uh, Technical Marketing Engineer at Avir. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to dive into some of the different use case uh, environments that we work with. Uh, one of the main uh, long-term use cases that we've had great success with is the media space, entertainment space, especially in rendering. Uh, <clears throat> and Bernie, I'm going to pause here and, and let you dive in. No, absolutely. So, um, so the media and entertainment uh, space is interesting because they are uh, compute hogs, right? The type of work that they do requires immense amounts of compute uh, capabilities, and obviously you can't do compute without data, and therefore they're constantly facing the challenge of how do I feed the data to my compute infrastructure fast enough, and how do I grow my compute infrastructure large enough to get my work done in a certain amount of time without uh, blowing out the, the storage capabilities, the storage performance capabilities. Um, so. Uh, some of the main challenge that they had was obviously scaling out their, their rendering performance, but they also started using multiple sites because they started facing constraints within their own data centers. So a lot of them would start uh, renting data centers or, bar or borrowing colo cages, putting racks of gear in there, um, but they were always faced with the challenge of, okay, how do I get back to my data, right? Just running a one gig or a 10 gig link between the sites did not yield the bang for the buck that they were looking for because now the value of your compute decreases as the distance between your data and your compute increases. Hence, uh, the need for, uh, for the edge file or caching technology. Um, you know, other constraints dealing with, you know, ca uh, data center space and power, uh, keeping all these separate storage silos uh, uh, healthy and managing them, and then obviously the, the WAN latency. So what we were able to do for them was provide them with the physical FXT that they could deploy uh, a cluster at their, at their various sites where they have their large scale compute infrastructure. Um, and then basically we can present file system views to their applications that are um, homogenous across all the different sites. So what that allowed them to do is take uh, a render, uh, uh, render operating system image that, that lived on one uh, client in one data center, they could just go ahead and put that up in another data center, a diff totally different site, just change the set of IP addresses that that client would be mounting, and that all the files that they're looking for, their binaries, uh, their, their textures, and all their input and output data, would actually live in the same exact paths as they were used to. So that allowed them to basically spin up all these different uh, locations without having the, to actually rework their, uh, their, machi their machine image deployment uh, strategies and things like that. Uh, some of our even more savvy customers started net booting uh, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, render nodes <coughs> off of the, off via NFS um, from our caches. So they could actually just drop the cache off, drop a bunch of brand new blades there, and boom, they were off and going. Um, so uh, the the, the extreme levels of performance that they, that they require, they have very casual works, working sets. So even though you have, let's say, a remote system that's hauling back to your on-premises centralized piece of storage where all of their assets live, um, and you only have a one gig link, let's say, between those two sites, which you're going to max out at 115, 120 megabytes per second of throughput, they, their, work, their working sets were actually so effectively cached by our system that they would end up pulling you know, two, four, six gigabytes a second out of our hardware clusters that were sitting in their co-location site when you were only using 70% of this link here. So that's basic, and, and without that caching solution in place, all that traffic would have ended up going back and forth across the link. Um, and that gave them the, the, the abilities to you know, spin these up or you know, at, the end of a, at the end of a show when they're like, oh my God, we're running behind schedule, we need to double the amount of compute that we're doing, where do we put it, how do we feed this, the storage to it, all these types of challenges we were, we were able to effectively uh, help them with. Yep. Which then brings you to the cloud bursting case, which is where they were like, okay, well, we're no longer going to rent a colo uh, cage and, and ship and, you know, rent blades and install them and put switching and networking and all that kind of stuff. Great, let's, le let's leverage the Amazon spot uh, market, for example, where we can get, you know, a $4 instance for, you know, 40 cents an hour or whatever, you know, one-tenth of the price or whatnot. Yep. Um, same, same challenges though, right? 
uh, the application uh, images that they're working with, they, they are standardized for their on-prem environment. Um, customizing them to run in the cloud is one thing, but then how do you feed the data to them, right? They, the the M&E customers were like, well, the MPA doesn't want us copying data into cloud buckets was one challenge. The other thing is we never know what files we're going to need for a given render job, so we'd have, to, we'd have to basically, they would have to analyze each render job and be like, oh, we need this set of files, and they would copy that set of files because they got petabytes upon petabytes of data here. It's not feasible to copy it all up into the cloud. Um, so they leverage our technology, spin us up inside of the virtual cloud uh, as a virtual appliance, um, and then point their render farms at us. And yeah, right there, you can even see inside of Google Compute, you, get, you can get 4.3 gigabytes a second out of a, you can do that out of a six node cluster, I believe. Um, and then that will um, allow them to consume the resources. Anything that, that these processes generate and write get pushed back to your on-premises. You tear all that infrastructure down. And whoever the humans are that are sitting here looking for the results, we will be able to see them <coughs> and analyze them in real time. And historically, a lot of these guys would work with their leasing agencies in, in Hollywood that will bring racks of servers, right? And you can lease them for the period of time. And that's really their main problem is they run out of time and they need to significantly increment the amount of compute. And then they don't necessarily need that compute again for some period of time. So they don't want to commit to it. But these leases are typically six months. So they were looking, they're looking for a more transient way to burst. And in fact, we had uh, one customer, this is actually uh, from that example, they, they ran 65,000 cores in Google Compute. Um, against, I think our, our cluster was 22 nodes against an Isilon farm back on-prem to render an entire set of frames for a movie. So, and, and they tore it all down. And we have customers that recently, my gosh, uh, what were they, 4.7 gig of IOPS running daily for weeks. Um, but then when they were done, they were done. They could tear it all down. So it's a very powerful use case for, for this vertical because they always have this problem. All right. Ah, video transfer. There you go. Yeah, Ready? Just, yep. There you go. Thanks, sir. Um, so another, another media type problem. Um, basically, now everybody has a mobile device. Everybody's got an Apple TV, a Roku, whatever. And the content providers actually have to create the different output formats for each one of those devices. Um, so a lot of the... Um, the producers of the content, they outsource the transcoding capabilities, or they'll have an in-house shop that, that performs these transcoding uh, activities. Um, but what it really comes down to is they can only do so many transcodes in parallel at a given time. It's a very I.O. intensive process. You're reading in a, a, a master mezzanine video file, and then you're outputting you know, four, six, ten different formats of different varying resolutions and frame rates and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that I.O. thrashing is generated by these processes typically just wears out your filer. <laughs> and ends up uh, uh, overutilized and underwater, at which point they can't really do any more work. So now that digital video is actually you know, skyrocketing in terms of the, the utilization of it, these guys are faced with this challenge of like, oh my gosh, I have all this content that I need to transcode. Um, I want to use the cloud, or I, I want to build a much bigger transcoding farm here, but I don't have the storage to support it. Um, and really, uh, they were facing scheduling problems because they would have to stagger their, 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 the startup of each one of these processes so they wouldn't all kick off at once in the, the thundering herd type problem. Um, and then the last piece was that they have archived so much data that they were actually using tape-backed uh, uh, active archive type solutions, which then required them to copy it off of the tape, put it onto um, some higher performing NAS device, run the transcoding job, and then you know, handle the results after the fact. Um, so. Here's what your typical transcoding environment looks like. You have um, your transcoding farm, and you have an archive process. Uh, the archive process you know, unarchives a file, writes it to your storage. And then your transcoding farm, let's just say here, for an example, each source file is being transcoded to four different formats. So you got four X reads of each file, um, and then four X writes of each file, because you, you have to read it in and write it out. Um, you scale that out to any number of files, eventually you're going to overwhelm uh, the infrastructure here. Then you have the quality control piece, which is actually reading um, the original source file and the transcoded source file, comparing the two and making sure that there's no excessive uh, in, uh, encoding artifacts and things, you know, black, black, black screens or other, other inconsistencies. So that's, a, that's another thing where you're now reading the data back again, both the source and the one that you just wrote out. Another, another highly casual workload. And then there's the content distribution piece of it, which is uh, typically they'll use something like Aspera to push this out to their, to their end users. 
uh, to the consumers of the content, um, and that typically re also results in the reading of these files out of the, the centralized storage. Uh, when we talk about optimizing this environment, um, now we put in a VR cluster in the center, and that's really uh, uh, the, the, the infrastructure that's gonna handle the majority of the I.O. here. You still have your own archiving piece, so in this case, you're still relying on your, your existing NAS, your NetApp, let's say. Um, you have your own archiving piece that writes it once here. Then you have all of the general purpose access to like desktop users, people who are browsing video files and whatnot. But when you actually kick off the transcoding farm, um, you know, they're still doing the four reads and the four writes for each source file, but we actually only have to read it once. Um, and uh, since we're caching the writes, we can actually take all the small I.O. writes that might be, you know, let's say 4K, 16 kilobyte, 64 kilobyte writes that the transcoding engine is generating. We can actually cache those, coalesce them, and then write them out to the NAP in 512 kilobyte uh, writes, which is a lot more efficient from a processing standpoint on the NAP. So we can actually reduce the amount of uh, network, th network uh, packets that are going back and forth, um, the, the, the parsing of the RPCs, and all that kind of stuff that would generate a lot of... Uh, CPU utilization over here, we can actually reduce that. And then the quality control piece is you're reading these files which have already been cached by our system, so you're no longer hitting the NetApp for that. And then the last piece is the content distribution where files are being read out and pushed out to the, to the internet or whatnot. And once again, those all come out of the cache. Um, obviously here, there's a lot of uh, math to be done. How many source files am I dealing with? How many output files am I dealing with? What size? Um, how, how long does this process take? And then that is basically gonna drive you towards the sizing of this solution to capture what the, what, the, what the amount of work that you intend to be doing in a certain amount of time. Um, and it's, it's pretty predictable when you think about the size of the files and how you're dealing with them. So the sizing exercise here is definitely a lot more straightforward than, than some other use cases that we have. Um, but this is definitely um, something that we've had a lot of success with because there's always this, this need to be transcoding a lot of video. Um, and it's a highly casual workload. And I mean, honestly, you can probably replace some of these, some of these software processes with other scientific discovery uh, you know, type applications or whatnot, it doesn't necessarily need to be media and entertainment. All we focus on is like, what are the patterns? What are people doing? What, what is it that's overloading in this, this NAS device and how can we uh, ameliorate that? Um, so here, like in a, a simulation example, is what we did is I, in the lab, you, I mocked it up. I have an FXT 4200, which is our, our, our uh, the 5200 is our current gen, the 4200 was our prior gen. I had a ZFS white box core filer um, it had all my source media files on there. And then basically I dispatched jobs here that perform the reading and the writing of these files. Um, and essentially I ended up with 32 concurrent source files with four readers each. So that's like basically 128 threads reading that. Um, and then 128 threads that are writing the output files because each reader is generating an output file. Um, and at that point in time, I ran through kind of a step, uh, lockstep type uh, workload where I would start with one source file, two source files, four, eight, 16, and basically showing how uh, the, the performance can scale as you start increasing the thread count. Uh, typically, um, with a non-scale-out NAS, your, your limits are going to be much lower because you're forced to a single box, a single set of spindles, a single set of CPUs, and network ports, and stuff like that. Here, actually, the 16 source files was the most optimal. The 32 source files started not performing so well, and that's because we were re reaching limitations on the capabilities of the core filer itself and how much we could pull data, how rapidly we could pull data off of that core filer. Um, but essentially what this ended up being was uh, about 1.3 gigabytes per second of reads, um, giving each process a 20 megabyte per second uh, uh, flow rate, which is pretty much spot on with what the, what the customers are looking for in these types of transcoding environments. Um, and that only generated a load of 325 megabytes a second against the core filer. We were ingesting 280 megabytes per second of writes which basically is 4.3 uh, megabytes per second for each file that's being written out. And that gives you the, your, your, your typical five to one compression ratio that people are seeing <coughs> when they're transcoding these types of videos and stuff like that. Um, life sciences. Okay. That's your bag. So walking into life sciences here, so we're, we're at 30 minutes left. So um, <coughs> this is an interesting space for us uh, because not so much, there's, there's two main use cases. There's the archive and then there's the processing. What's been happening over the course of the last several years is uh, explosion in bioinformatic workloads. So not the genetic sequencing itself. That's done by an Illumina genetic sequencer, gene sequencer, and, and that raw data is then stored off into an isolon or into some other environment. But 
when that raw data then is worked on by researchers, uh, they have to do a whole series of, of things, basically a whole lot of math, um, to come to an understanding of the variance uh, in the gene. And so there's this process called alignment, and then there's a quality check. It should all sound familiar because it's kind of similar to some of the workflow of transcoding and all the other workloads. So, um, you know, the, the modus operandi here was read heavy. Um, and so one of the use cases was uh, the uh, genomic analysis toolkit, uh, which basically allows you to manipulate, uh, you know, genes, align them, and do all of this workflow that we're talking about. Um, how do you get it to go faster? Because again, uh, it's, it, it, it doesn't matter what vertical we're talking about, it, the theme is the same. I can have far more compute brought to bear against my storage than I can have storage stand up to meet the challenge in the time that I need it. Um, and so how do I make things go faster? In this particular case, we used the physical FXTs against an Isilon X series cluster. Uh, did around 1,000 one offload, which basically means that uh, uh, for every 1,000 writes, there was one, or 1,000 reads, there was a cold read, so a new, a new read to the back end. So it was highly efficient uh, processing of the workload uh, against these environments. But the real interesting part for us, and what we're working, we're working on this with a lot of people, this is H3 Biomedicine. Um, H3 Biomedicine basically uh, processes all of their post uh, sequencing analytics. They do everything in Amazon. They do everything in EC2 compute. Um, and I believe increasingly the data itself, even though, I just wanted to try and use the pointer, but it won't work. Um, even though this, this diagram suggests that all the data is resident in the NAS, over time, they're gradually moving the data up behind the veers in, in the S3 buckets as well, so that they can be completely cloud-based. Why would they do this? They're a smaller shop. So they're not a, a giant AstraZeneca, or they're, they're not the Broad in New England. Um, they're, they're a smaller shop, and this allows these smaller shops to be very competitive in this space um, because what they were able to do is leave the on-prem, keep all of their workflows exactly the same, keep all of their tools. I mean, all of these tools that the, the, uh, the bioinformatic guys use, are very con they're, they're very file-oriented, and so this allows them to have continuity and go into the cloud. Um, we also have, I mentioned the Broad, uh, they're one of our customers and they actually use one of the clouds, I won't mention who, um, and they put petabytes of information into the storage, petabytes, um, that they are going to then leverage the compute environment uh, to process. Um, and so that's a fairly large institution making a fairly significant stride into one of the public clouds. Um, and they're, they're one of those guys, I think they're pretty heavily in to the public cloud. Um, but there's, you know, they also still have a fairly significant uh, large uh, on-premise uh, implementation. And this is sort of the active archive use case. So one of the, one of the uh, definite uh, facts with the uh, bioinformatic uh, data is there's a lot of it and it's large. The working set size is uh, right now uh, for your average workload or maybe eight terabytes, nine terabytes. But that's temporary. I think that's th there's you know there's efforts going on to have a, f a finer resolution of sequencing of the genomes, and as that happens, the amount of data for a uh, working set will probably start going up above 20 terabytes, 24 terabytes, 30 terabytes, um, and suddenly the the costs of storing and keeping all that local. And having it available, for example, uh, it, you know, internationally for different sites is a real challenge. And so uh, they're starting to look seriously at putting data into uh, the object storage environments in the cloud and then leveraging uh, the compute environments in, in the cloud on demand for different uh, geographic regions to access the same data for research. Okay? Yeah, in fact... Uh, Actual customer results for this active archive, as of June, it was four petabytes. Uh, for this customer here, it's now above 12 petabytes, all up in one of the clouds. <coughs> so, actually, this cloud. So, and then there are still people, though, that are, this is an actual customer implementation, that are leveraging <coughs> private object storage, because there are certain customers out there that have made that choice I mentioned at the very beginning, which is, 
They are deciding on using private object storage. They're deciding on keeping a lot of things in-house. Uh, it's the way it's always been done, or there's security concerns, or there's privacy concerns. Somewhere in that realm of, of concerns. Um, and again, it's really the same type of use case for us, uh, whether it's public or private. We can archive the data into an object environment, provide a POSIX front end and performance caching, um, and then you can use that data for your workloads. I know who that <coughs> customer is. They're, they're my customer. Oh, they are? Yeah. Okay. Well, so then you're very intimate with this. So. I've been to two of those three data centers. <laughs> Okay, and then we're almost done um, with the use cases. This is a really exciting one. So, um, analytic throughput and financial services. So, there's there's a lot of things happening. I'm sure that you know one of the big press things these days is fintech, and you hear all about blockchain and all these other things. That's not what this is about. What this is about is that while all these new technologies that are still fairly nascent are being evolved. Um, there are large financial institutions, and I'm not talking about the giant six banks or so, um, and insurance agency or insurance companies and so on, that have tremendous amounts of, of data uh, in their NAS environments and are doing intense analytic workloads against all of this data. Um, for example, uh, the hedge fund industry. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of. <coughs> I, I did a lot of research on hedge funds. I learned that there's a, 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 a lot of different classes of hedge funds. There's even a hedge fund that hedges on parking tickets in New York City, which I found <coughs> utterly interesting. They're not what we'd call a quantitative hedge fund, although who knows what they really do behind the scenes, right? But there is a whole class called quantitative hedge funds. And this is where the whole quant concept comes from, where they use a lot of data, like time series pricing data on a stock. And they stir in regulatory or environmental data or public information from other things plus their own sort of internal data, and they have algorithms that run against this data in a cluster compute environment. Okay, so again, just like in life sciences, just like in media and entertainment, bringing up thousands of cores of compute against some data set, probably reading the same data hundreds and hundreds of times <coughs> across this thing, looking to kill as much latency as possible so that they can get the job done as quickly as they can. And we, we really start to think about this as analytic throughput. So this is how many jobs can I run through my compute core, my compute cluster, um, and how quickly can they get done? Because that will all translate into me being able to do more and more and more. And the reason that we started to talk about this in this way is because our actual experience with these guys, uh, and I can never mention any of them, right, on pain of death, um, is that once they start to up their throughput of their compute cluster, by using a veer or whatever they're using, um, all of a sudden new jobs appear out of nowhere and new demand appears out of nowhere. And they start growing this entire environment and growing this entire environment. Some of them are growing it all in house. They're just going to keep growing compute, et cetera, et cetera. It's their secret sauce. They don't want anybody to know what they're doing. Some of them are starting to look at offloading some of this work into the cloud, especially on the compute side. So we work with a fairly substantial fund that every night wakes up, uh, I don't know, what is it these days, uh, 14,000 cores or 17,000 cores <coughs> in one of the compute clouds, runs some back testing operations, and then crushes the whole thing down, and that's it for three the day. Three hours later. Yeah, three hours later. And the reason that they could do it in three hours is the job usually took 12 hours um, on-prem, but they were able to leverage more compute cores in the cloud and get it done quicker, right? Um, and so all of these guys are realizing that they need to go faster on the quant on the quantitative analysis side if they're in the quantitative hedge fund space. Um, conversely, there's other comp there's other organizations like uh, insurance companies that do um, annuities, and the annuity is based on a portfolio, and that portfolio needs to be continuously rebalanced so that the insurance company is able to get the return that they're looking for on on that particular annuity. Um, and so that's highly computational. It's all based on pricing data. Um, and so the more aggressively uh, uh, quick they can be about that, the more they can do it, the more effective uh, the decisions will be. And so the type of things that we see moving into the cloud, into the cloud compute environments, like the Amazons and the Googles of the world, are these like computationally intensive. There's this uh, you know, standard Monte Carlo simulation work, workload that's based on some amount of time series data. It's, it's part and parcel there because the more compute nodes I can bring up, the faster it's going to get done. It's, it's really there. Read heavy workloads. So writes typically are not as uh, fast as what you can do with your reads. The more reading you can do up there, 
uh, the, the more compute you can bring up, the faster it's going to get done, and uh, the less risk because I'm not worrying about abandoning rights. Um, and so I can read in that large amount of data. Um, batch or burst, so on demand, being able to run simulations um, overnight uh, is, is a pretty typical uh, and popular use case. Um, and then ultimately down the line, I think it's going to start getting towards a more on demand sort of thing. So right now today, there's uh, mostly batch work being done intraday. Um, and then there's uh, real time pricing that's sometimes done. I think that's all going to start converging. And then off in the distance, you can start to see uh, the future, which is artificial intelligence and um, big tables and big queries and all of these things coming down the, down the pike. Um, <coughs> but the way we sort of are learning about this from, from this market is that perhaps uh, they're going to be hedging a little bit. And they're going, I don't even mean that as a turn of phrase, it's just a fact. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be clever. It's what they do. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so ultimately, they want to use the cloud. Um, they want to have the cost advantages that they can get from the cloud. They want to perhaps play the clouds off on each other to see if they can get optimal pricing. Um, and then in the end, they still have a data center. And so why would you still have the data center? Because these guys have a lot of money um, and they have uh, a need to continuously innovate so that they can remain competitive. And so they might start to look at their data center as sort of their secret weapon, as sort of their R&D center for, for more and more advanced things while leveraging the clouds for like the parity workloads. Um, there's some people that are looking at uh, some of the messaging that's coming out of uh, some of the major cloud providers about their AI in this space, and that's certainly real. Um, but then there's also a lot of people that are looking at sort of the spread between them, right? Because you never know what's going to happen with the cloud providers in terms of uh, overall uh, reputation, They've, you know, we've had pretty good experience with them so far. There hasn't been a negative press that I can think of for years. That could change at some point. So you have to be prepared for all of these, uh, these possibilities. Um, and so one of the reasons that we work with a lot of these guys and they like it is because the Avere allows you to sort of keep your data in your data center uh, for as long as you need to and then just leverage the compute environments as you like. Or you can put some of the data into the cloud if you like and then you can move it out with the Avere technology as well and actually mirror it between the, the two technologies. Uh, and we do have, this is the use case that I mentioned earlier where a customer was bringing up quite a bit of cores. I think we said 17, there's even, they, <laughs> their highest order test was 45,000. Um, and, and again, it's exactly the same success that they had, like this one happened to go against I think 16 of your uh, nodes in a cluster, um, but it was the fact that they could bring the sheer number of nodes to bear and the working set size itself was fairly small. I think it was roughly 500 gig uh, to a terabyte of working set. Um, and they were able to really reduce the amount of time that it took them to produce that particular job. Um, that said, there's still a lot of people doing this. And this is, um, I have a large compute cluster. I have workflow built all around this. My quants are able to use the job scheduler very easily. I may have even written the job scheduler. I'm using a third party, it doesn't matter. Um, and this is fine. And in fact, the trend lines here that we are talking to people about are, are less about moving to the cloud and more about can we put faster networking interfaces into our boxes as they evolve to perhaps 25 and then ultimately 100 gig uh, interfaces. And we do have very successful customers that are running, I think there's, a, there's multiple clusters at one of them um, that are just running jobs all day and all night. Um, and the nice thing about it is they're able to they have a Tokyo branch or an Asian branch and they're able to send jobs to the compute cluster and, and get everything processed very quickly. Um, and this may seem old school, but people are expanding these today. So um, I don't think it's quite done yet. Absolutely, yeah. It's a great use case for, for the Avers. Uh And then I think this is just a repeat of the other one, isn't it? It is. All right, and then the last sort of use case slide that we have, because um, it's about 316 now, is uh, enterprise adoption of hybrid cloud. And this is really just talking about um, leveraging the cloud storage uh, while being able to retain your applications written as they are today um, and be able to, uh, to uh, have just basically a NAS, but the back end of the NAS is, is S3 or it's GCS. Okay? <coughs> 